Hello everyone, my name is Alexander and today with my colleague Sergey we are going to talk security of a modern popular, modern popular modem named Centurion and we will try to answer a very interesting question is it possible to hack a car with only 5 SMS messages? So stay tuned. Um, our talk is consists of uh, several topics. First, we are going to introduce our modem, and uh, in this part we will talk about previous researches and uh, the software pieces of the modem itself. After that, we will move on to talk about firmware extraction. In this topic, we will briefly cover how we extract all software pieces to analyze them, and after that, we will move on to Analysis. First, we will talk about middlet analysis, and after that, we are going to talk about firmware analysis and uh, what is the interesting stuff we found there. And so, first, let us introduce ourselves. I'm a principal security researcher at Kaspersky ICS CERT. For more than 10 years, I am reverse engineering and searching for vulnerabilities in hardware, firmware, software. And for more than 10 years, I am sharing my knowledge with the students as a senior lecturer. Uh, hello, my name is Sergei Anofrienko. I've been working at Kaspersky for almost 20 years now. Uh, took part in many different projects and for 20 years I was very interested in reverse engineering and hardware, tinkering stuff. So five years I've uh, been working together with Alexander uh, with uh, our, uh, by reverse engineering and uh, our main priority is industrial and I IoT. So why did we decide to take a closer look at this uh, particular modem? which uh, initially we have discovered it has been used in an uh, electronic control unit uh, installed in a big truck by made, uh, made by a famous Russian company. But in addition to this, we have found these modems to be installed in different kinds of applications, at least including this uh, shown on the current slide, like industrial computers, medical equipment, other types of cars, payment terminals and uh, laptop extension cards and other things not displayed on the current slide as well. Before starting the research, we of course wanted to analyze if there are any existing research affecting regarding our modems, but uh, the only one existing vulnerability that we could find was a very trivial directory traversal vulnerability with very little little real impact and uh, requiring physical access to the device. But as you can see, this uh, vulnerability was uh, in the news uh, with headlines like this. And uh, if uh, we talk about this particular directory traversal vulnerability, then these headlines maybe seem too exaggerated, but if we think about what if a real, a real modem installed in a truck gets hacked and a truck accidentally change its direction, or maybe some medical device will malfunction, putting patients at risk, or maybe an industrial computer will start to send its data to somewhere else, then uh, the real impact of such vulnerabilities is will match the the news titles like here shown. And now we will briefly examine the modem from a high level perspective. <laughs> its software comprised uh, into four components. The first one is uh, its firmware and uh, it's just uh, an operation system uh, binary image stored on non-flash memory. The other three components are Java applications applets, and here they named midlets. Uh, there are only two code privileges for those midlets manufacturer and user. So the usual 
midlet is just a midlet that implements uh, the user business logic and uh, it can be signed or unsigned no matter it will run as a, a user with the user privileges and uh, the last two midlets are jersey and slayer they both are manufacturer midlets and so they execute with the manufacturer privileges so they have no restrictions at all to access uh, anything on the modem itself so they have no restrictions for example to access its uh, file system uh, its communication channels and etc and of course uh, user midlets have su such restrictions and uh, when we talk about security we need to cover the topic about the manufacturer assumptions about its security and when we talk about uh, midlets, its integrity is ensured only by the digital signature. Is it's as usual as for uh, usual Java middle, uh, Java applet. And uh, when we talk about confidentiality, there are two interesting assumptions. The first one is that we, as a user, don't even know. Only manufacturer knows uh, where the all midlets are stored on the modem's file system. This is very interesting. And the second consumption is that if we somehow know where it stores on the modem's file system, we need to download it. And the operation system will restrict us to do so by filtering uh, such operation for any file with a dot .jar um, name. So if we somehow can bypass the, those Assumptions, we will compromise uh, the middle security. And uh, when we talk about operation system, it's um, easier because uh, when we talk about its integrity and its confidentiality, both are ensured only by cryptography. So the manufacturer uh, distributed uh, the operation uh, system image in, uh, in, uh, in uh, in the way that it is encrypted fully and if you are not a valid customer you can just go to the internet and download it so we decide not to waste our time for searching uh, some p software pieces in the internet but as we already have the modem itself we just going to try to download this software using its communication channels and the first step to do so is a hardware analysis First of all, we decided to remove the protection, uh, the protective screen from one of the models we had. And uh, under the shield, we have found a few interesting integrated chips, which are shown on the current slide. Uh, the first one is the Intel x uh 625 baseband processor. The other one is uh, one gigabyte of RAM combined with some NAND flash memory, which actually contains the firmware and two other chips are the multiband power amplifier and the radio frequency transceiver. Uh, since we have already like started to do destructive actions of one of the modules, we also took this chance to uh, remove the baseband processor and the NAND flash chip uh, from the module because uh, while searching information online regarding the baseband processor, we were able to find uh, in some smartphone repair manuals, we found the pinout of the similar but different Intel baseband processor, which happily happened to match our pinouts, and there were JTAG pins available. So we decided to check if uh, the JTAG pins are somehow routed to the outside of the module, and eventually we found that, yes, the JTAG pins were routed, but the pins they were routed to were marked as do not use in the module's datasheet. And the existing uh, symbols uh, like available for PCB design software did not route these pins, so we had to design our own PCB. Uh, we wrote it all the do not use pins out to connectors. We also wrote it the USB interface, uh, the radio frequency interface, and the physical serial U UART connectors. Uh, it's an interesting fact that the module datasheet clearly says that uh, if you want to try and resolder a module module to another application, another PCB, uh, then this action will probably destroy the module because it's not designed for another additional soldering cycle. 
But uh, yes, eventually we accidentally destroyed a few models before we actually got a working combination with our PCB, which you can see on the photo. And then we started to try to interact with the JPEG interface. The first thing we could observe is the JPEG ID, which you can see on the current slide. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is that the ID stated that this chip belongs to, not to Intel, but to Infineon. And uh, actually, we found that there is true because uh, it happens that uh, the business, modern business of Infineon was sold and bought by the Intel company. But there were no information available online about how to interact with the GTAC interface and everything we could find about all other Infineon chips didn't match our observations. Uh, I mean, the real behavior of the chip, how it responds to JTAG requests, did not match what was in the data sheets we could find. So we hacked up of JTAG Fuzzer. The JTAG Fuzzer actually did find some interesting effects when we written into certain JTAG registers but we didn't uh, manage to make it completely usable and eventually we could not get access to the ARM core of the baseband processor. So we decided to abandon this JTAG story and move on to the analysis of the contents of the NAND flash memory. And so after we failed with JTAG, uh, as Sergey says, we Manage not to waste our time and search another opportunity for downloading some software pieces via communication channels. But we are going straight forward and the soldier is not flash memory. And of course, uh, before we uh, read it first time, we even don't know if there is uh, any encryption used. But fortunately, when we read it, we uh, figure out that there is uh, no encryption used uh, on the non-flash memory, and moreover, there is uh, no any non-file system used behind the memory itself. So, the only problem we need to solve is uh, the bit errors, because uh, we don't know is simply nominal, but uh, we easily bypass this uh, using the majority function that let us decide if the bit must be set or not. So, uh, after uh, so, so some attempts to read in the non-flash memory, we got a full physical memory dump, and uh, we uh, move on to analyze it. Uh, as you know, uh, every non-physical uh, memory uh, consists of uh, physical blocks, so which uh, divided into physical pages and physical sectors. And uh, there is also so name uh, spare area, uh, which holds uh, some information about the NAND itself uh, and uh, about uh, uh, its uh, in internals. Uh, so in our case, uh, the operation system uses, uh, of course, uh, not the physical blocks, sectors and pages, but the logical ones, and so we have to somehow restore this mapping between logical block, uh, block numbers, sector numbers, page numbers, uh, to physical ones. Uh, to do so, we just uh, analyze the physical uh, memory dump, uh, find out uh, the sector size, in our case it was uh, 512 bits, and after every single sector, we find uh, its spare area. So we decide to look at the spare area solely. And uh, when we look at it solely, we can easily find that there is uh, some fields. And uh, we decide that two of them are uh, maybe logical block number and uh, logical sector number in which it translates uh, the physical sector. Uh, so using this information, uh, we just uh, write some code to implement uh, the, this mapping, and uh, after that, uh, we get some logical blocks. Uh, the numbers of all gained logical blocks uh, you can see in the le left bottom corner on the slide. And uh, some of these blocks were populated with data, some of these blocks uh, were zeroed. But uh, fortunately, among these blocks, uh, we found one block which stores the operation system 
the operation system uh, image. This image was not encrypted at all, and the part of this image uh, you can see on the slide on the right bottom corner. Moreover, uh, among these uh, blocks, we found uh, one block which holds the modem's file system. In our case, it's a FAT file system, and the start of its file system you can uh, see on the slide on the right upper corner. And uh, so, as we have a full file system image, uh, we can just mount it, and uh, fortunately, we finally can find those uh, super hidden paths um, where all midlets are stored. Here they are on the slide. You can see them too now. Uh, and of course, as we have restored all file system, we have uh, any midlets and manufacturer and user, and so now we can analyze them. And let's start to do this by analyzing its, uh, uh, its representation on the modem's file system. Let me remind you that uh, midlets are Java applications, uh, which are designed to run on the Java Micro Edition virtual machine and uh, initially they consist of two files when the user wants to install a midlet he will copy a jr file with uh, its jid file to the modem's file system by usb and uh, run a special at command to install it into the modem as a result of this execution of this at command the modem will be copied to the hidden place we just shown you on the previous slide and the original files will be deleted from the file system. However, their original path and name of the GID file will be preserved and saved into a database so that uh, the user can later retrieve it using a, another special IT command which is used to list uh, all the installed midlets. You can see its output uh, on the current slide. Uh, also, as Alexander has uh, mentioned before, the manufacturer has implemented uh, protective mechanisms which prevent a midlet uh, from uh, accessing any files with .jar extension. So if you even try to roll your own midlet to use it to read other files, uh, other midlets byte code, you will get an exception like the one shown on this slide which allows us to think that manufacturer has uh, different security mechanisms to ensure midlets security confidentiality. But as we now have uh, the complete file system at our hands, we can analyze uh, how the installed midlets are stored. And actually each installed midlet uh, is represented with four files. We will review their contents now. The first file has the .ss extension. It, it happens to contain the descriptor of midlet permissions. As we know, there are only two kinds of permissions, the user or normal permissions and manufacturer unlimited permissions. The picture on the right shows you the data which corresponds to the manufacturer permissions set. And you might wonder, it must be not possible to just copy this permissions descriptor file to replace another midlet's description with this and get uh, manufacturer permissions because there are digital signatures, right? But uh, it seems that uh, digital signatures are only checked when the midlet is installed, but not when it's started. So a midlet, if it knows how to access the file system, can use this to elevate its privileges to the manufacturer level, as we will show later. Another file with the .ii extension contains various service information, like the certificate used to sign the midlet. The third file is actually the GAD manifest. The one shown here actually belongs to the manufacturer midlet called JRC, which is privileged midlet. And you can see that the midlet certificate store is set to firmware, which further proves that this midlet is not just an ordinary user midlet. The last file actually is the jar file with the midlet's bytecode. Okay, and now, as you remember, there are two security consumptions about midlet's confidentiality, which we successfully bypassed by desoldering uh, the NAND flash memory of the modem. 
uh, and destroying some items in between. But is there uh, any non-destructive way to gain those knowledge? And the answer is yes, if you know where to search for. Um, as we reverse engineering the midlets, uh, we find out that there is a very interesting uh, Java class available for every midlet, uh, not only a manufacturer one, but uh, any user midlet too, can call any function from this class. And among these functions, there is the one static, uh, static function, publicly available, uh, which uh, lists all of uh, Java system properties. And among these properties, there is the one property that holds uh, those hidden secret paths. So you don't need to desoldrate and do the stuff with the NAND. You just need to call once the public static function and you will get those hidden secrets. Okay, there is uh, another problem. You, if you already know these secrets, but you don't want to destroy your modem, you need to somehow bypass the restriction of downloading those midlets from the modem. And uh, as we reverse engineering the midlets, we find out that there is not only the restriction about uh, the dot .jar extension, but there is also a restriction in access uh, the hidden path. So if your path is uh, consists of a substring with dot .center on dot, uh, you will not get a handle to those uh, file on this path, but you will have only an uh, error. But there is uh, the solution. We find out that uh, there is a FTP client, uh, which uh, can be accessed uh, by manufacturer and uh, by manufacturer midlets and uh, by the user midlets, of course. Uh, this uh, is uh, a usual FTP client used to download or upload something from uh, any FTP server. Okay, what's wrong? As you remember, the GRC is a manufacturer midlet, and we find out that this FTP client is only a part of a GRC midlet, so it has no restrictions to access any files on file system at all. So if you just kindly ask this uh, service to upload uh, any midlet on any hidden path to uh, your FTP server, it will do it for you. So we can uh, now download uh, any midlets from the file system and from hidden paths too. So, as uh, we highlighted on the previous slide, there is uh, only one problem we want to solve. This is about uh, the restriction, as you see here, there is a restriction uh, about the substring in the hidden path. If we want uh, to somehow uh, pre escalate privilege of uh, our usual user midlet, we need to somehow bypass this uh, restrict, and uh, so we found uh, the usual native path traversal. Uh, it uh, stands that uh, the first uh, it checks the first uh, driver uh, checks for special characters, and after that only converts the escape characters uh, sequence to the ASCII. So we can easily bypass those restrictions, and uh, moreover we find out that there is not only one virtual root A, but there is also a virtual root B. Uh, which can be accessed only by a manufacturer privileged midlets, uh, and they restored the special manufacturer uh, midlet named Sly. Uh, after that, we got anything we need to just uh, create proof of concept of local privilege escalation. Uh, so let's start the first demo. Uh, on the left slide, uh, you can see uh, the terminal uh, where we send uh, the special AT commands. Now we install our midlet on the modem. Uh, after that, uh, we just send a command to start uh, system logout on the right terminal. And now we run first time our midlet. Our midlet running first time. And uh, on the right, you can see that it checks if it has manufacturer privileges or not. Uh, the first time we run it, it of course not, uh, will not have manufacturer privileges, so we try to escalate those using those vulnerabilities we previously talked. After that it executed, it's exited, and we run the midlet the second time. The second time it runs, it checks if it has the manufacturer privileges, and now it has ones. So it just tries to access those hidden paths without any vulnerability, and now it's succeed. So 
We have a full proof of concept that uh, if we have a physical access to the modem, uh, we can uh, just uh, elevate privilege for any user middle and of course uh, we can uh, uh, just exchange the manufacturer middlets like GRC and SLI by uh, our middlets. And uh, this uh, physical vector ca can be obtained by physical access uh, and uh, the physical supply chain attacks uh, can be, as all you know. Uh, but we ask ourselves, if it's possible to exploit those vulnerabilities, but remotely it's more interesting, of course. And uh, to answer this question, uh, we uh, move on to an analysis of its firmware and we start from the modems 80 commons. The AT, <coughs> the AT command interface is probably the interface available in just any modem. And what's good about it is that you only need a console. It's enough to interact with it. So we decided to start with this interface and, uh, we decided to employ Fuzzin technique to analyze this interface. To do that, we of course need uh, to build a corpus and uh, instead of relying only on publicly available documentation, we, since we already had the image, the firmware image, we decided to search for all the available AT commons there. So shortly we were able to find uh, a big number of user or general AT commons. M many of them had a description and a descriptor, which, for example, contains information about how many parameters does a command expect. So there were more like 100 more commands than were available in the publicly available documentation. One of the undocumented uh, user commands was the AT plus xlog command, which happened to output information about the most recent hardware or software fault, which has happened in the modem. And this command is very handy because for our father, it allows us to get feedback of uh, execution of our AT commands. So after executing some command, we can understand if the modem has crashed or not. Also, in addition to general AT commands, we found a large number of, we call it vendor specific AT commands. They had different syntax, not just like the IT commons were used to, but it's more like a call of some scripting language function. It has a namespace, it has a function name, it has argument list, uh, very similar to scripting language. Many of these commons were related to testing of different modem subsystems uh, for pre-production, for calibration. But there were also an interesting namespace called the security interface, which contains some interesting IT commands. So we tried to call one of them and at first exceed. We were very happy because we've got the information. You can see on the current slide. Then we tried another interesting IT command, but it did not succeed. It just returned an error. So we headed back to the firmware code to find out the reason. And apparently these commands in the sec namespace were protected with some kind of cryptographic key, which uh, were calculated using modems, uh, modem hardware specific identifiers like the EMA and the serial number. And uh, although we knew the functions involved in calculation and verification of the key, we decided to not uh, go by fully reverse engineering it since we we still had lots of other namespaces and functions to analyze. And uh, among available IT vendor namespaces, we found functions that clearly hints their primary purpose is uh, to read and write RAM. And when we looked at their implementation, we easily confirmed this. So yes, exactly, in the release version of the modem's firmware, there is a command for reading and writing its memory. It's very interesting. Uh, but however, uh, despite the fact that uh, the presence of such functions in firmware, we uh, have uh, an error in its execution too. But now it's not uh, about some sp special security key. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, way, we find out that there is uh, some global variable stored in the 
modems RAM, uh, which sets uh, not by the user, but uh, only at the uh, man at manufacturer when uh, the, when manufacturer build its firmware. So we uh, have no idea how to change it in a valid way. But the more interested that this variable is just a bit variable. Uh, in our case, uh, it's a uh, zero. So if we can somehow change uh, it from zero to any other value, we can just bypass this uh, restriction and execute those commands. So we uh, try to find any vulnerability which can give us a write primitive. So we will use it to rewrite this variable. And of course, we start uh, from fuzzing 80 commands, as we already know everything about them. We know everything about uh, user 80 commands, vendor 80 commands, about those inputs. So we just use a regular Raspberry Pi, connect it via USB to send uh, the testing 80 commands to the modem, connect uh, Raspberry Pi via reset pin to reset the modem in case of it stalls, and uh, press start and wait for several weeks. After we return, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, it, uh, it sniffs uh, from uh, the start of January for all, for all holidays. Uh, so when we come back and uh, look uh, into the logs, uh, we find out many uh, crashes, and among them there is uh, the interesting uh, crash. Uh, it's a hipware flow. We find out that one of uh, 80 commands expects a uh, very big user input, consists of more than 10 variables, but, uh, but any of these variables is just a digit between 0 and 9. Uh, and uh, when it uh, operates the user input, it stores in it in the buffer with a static size. And of course, there is no restriction about uh, user input size uh, in the beginning, so we have a classic hyperflow. Uh, but uh, at uh, this point, we decided not to try to exploit this vulnerability because of two reasons. The first one is that uh, it's uh, clear that uh, if you can only send the digits, uh, it is uh, very hard to exploit heap overflow. And the second, uh, and the, uh, the, mo the most one, is uh, that at uh, the time we have uh, these results, we found out very interesting results by reverse engineering the protocols used for remote communication with the modem. And this protocol is uh, named SAPL. Uh, so let's move on to talk about the SAPL protocol and uh, how we remotely execute our code on the modem side. So first, let's briefly talk about uh, the SAPL, pro SAPL protocol itself. So the uh, modem offers geopositioning feature using SAPL subsystem. And this subsystem is responsible for implementation of the SAPL specification, uh, which implies exchange of special messages between modem and the server. And messages uh, are exchanged using user plane location binary protocol. In our case, the modem is the target set, and the server is on the left. Here you can see on the slides uh, the first initial uh, message between the modem and the server. So when we talk about uh, uh, SAPL implemented in the GSM, GPRS, uh, and Edge networks, it uses as a transportation level a web protocol stack. And uh, this protocol stack um, has the feature of fragmentation its payload. In our case, it's the SAPL message. So in the first uh, SAPL packet, we can uh, found the field which holds uh, the overall size of uh, the web pay payload. In our case, it's the SAPL message. It's the left uh, red arrow. Uh, but in this uh, first SAPL packet, we can to find the SAPL header, and the SAPL protocol itself has the ability to fragment its payload. So in this case, there is another variable which will contain its overall payload size. So there are uh, two 
variables in the first packet, which must be coherent. And uh, in any other packet, uh, we will see only the fragmented supple message payload. So, what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is that uh, in our implementation, as you saw, so there were two variables, and there were no check about uh, coherence of uh, these two variables. So, eventually, by sending a fragmented sample message uh, with uh, the total size of all its fragments uh, more than the sub size of the entire sample message specified in the first message, we could achieve a classic heap overflow again. And this time it was much more interesting. Uh, this vulnerability was found using static analysis, and from the first try we managed to craft an SMS message which led to a hardware fault in the modem. Using the AT plus X log command, we found out that each time the crash occurs in the same location inside the malloc function, and it happens because uh, what we are overwriting uh, using the overflow is the header of the next heap chunk, the chunk uh, which resides after the chunk we are writing to. And as part of this overflow, we are overwriting the magic value, which is the magic value if the chunk is free, or otherwise it should point to the heap-based structure which describes the entire state of the entire heap manager of the operating system. So when the malloc function tries to dereference this pointer, the modem crashes with a data access exception. And at this point, you can think uh, that this is what exactly we are looking for here, but not exactly. At those times, uh, when we just found this hyperflow, we know nothing about uh, its uh, uh, mem about uh, its uh, context. We know nothing about uh, the modem's uh, memory. We, know we have no uh, debug possibility, and so we need to somehow retrie retrieve some information for uh, this uh, can be exploited. And so we have to somehow find read primitive. And we remember that if we uh, crash the modem, we can read the crash dump via AT plus xlog command. And uh, this xlog command will return us with uh, every single uh, register of the CPU at the moment of the crash. And uh, what did our SMS? It's crash the modem. So if we will use not a dummy uh, data, but uh, the data which contains uh, the memory we that we want to read, we will store the, our data in our zero register, as you can see the code snippet on our slide. And so we have a plan. Uh, as the modern communication channels uh, gives us uh, tens and hundreds of megabits per second, we can read the data from the modem with a speed at about one byte per second. So it takes us about several weeks too to read every single memory byte we need. Uh, why? Because of the algorithm. The first we prepare our special SAPL SMS message, which contains the memory address we want to read. Next, we send it to the modem. The modem try to uh, act with our data, just uh, save the me mem memory value in our zero register and crashed. After that, we, uh, we wait for rebooting the modem and send AT plus XLAC command to get information about crash and uh, just export it to the R0 value as a memory value. And we repeat it again and again until we get everything we need. And so while we are waiting the, uh, for dumping all the memory from the modem, we just uh, use uh, this, mem uh, this time to develop Right, primitive. So while we were reading the memory using this very slow approach, we were analyzing the code 
of the memory manager in order to find a place which we could use as the right primitive. And the only place which is good for this was we found it in the free function. Uh, and why? Because uh, the heap we overflow is the global heap used by all the processes of the modem's operating system. And it happened uh, there was a check inside the free function uh, which checked if the current thread uh, is waiting for a memory allocation when the chunk is freed. So if it is waiting, the free function will update uh, the process thread structure with the address of the chunk it has just freed. And this is the right operation which we want to use, but in order to use it, we had to completely understand all the relationship and all the structures of the operating system, including the st thread structure, heap base structure, the heap chunk structures, and eventually we crafted uh, several fake operating system structures, put it into the heap, uh, inject our own chunk into the heap, and eventually all this work uh, allowed us to write a single pointer to a just free heap chunk into any memory address in the modem. And so now we are ready to launch our code and send some SMS for explode our heap flow. For this purpose we construct a map uh, of heap state after every SMS we will send. It was only a statical analysis result, so we uh, even not imagine how it will be when we really send this. This is uh, ju just what we are thinking about. Uh, but fortunate, this works fine. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there are only four SMS messages. Uh, they give us uh, a right primitive, uh, and uh, of course, uh, if you write in the right place of the pointer to your code, you get an execution. Uh, so, when I, f uh, in the beginning, talk about five SMS messages, uh, I mention that if you want to execute the code, you need four SMS messages for gain execution, and one SMS message to so somehow uh, up, uh, to somehow send payload to the modem. So our fifth SMS message contains uh, the payload. In our case, uh, this payload gives us uh, the ability to communicate with the truck scan bus. And if you're familiar with the uh, uh, automotive security, you know that if somebody can send something on the CAN bus, it's very bad. For example, you can uh, open the doors, uh, start engine, or maybe stop engine, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. But now uh, we will talk about write primitive, and next uh, we will cover how we obtain execution. At this point, we can write anything in the memory. So, of course, we decided to unlock those uh, hidden uh, commands to read and write memory and to not uh, wait about several weeks to read Madam's memory again. And so well, it's time for another demo. Uh, on the left terminal, you can see a special AT command to list all available, uh, available for our user with zero privileges uh, namespaces. It's uh, uh, not a big one. Uh, on the right terminal, we start sending our special sample SMS messages to uh, trigger heap overflow and to exploit the vulnerability. After sending is end, we again send speciality command, and now as you can see, there are more, much more namespaces available for, la for us. Uh, and, uh, Sergey? Sergey? Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, as you can see, uh, we can now read the modem's memory using those AT commands which are now available for us, uh, and uh, we can uh, now call every function from every namespace. And of course, uh, uh, this is due to uh, our updated user level. 
And of course now we cannot just read and write by memory, but we can bypass those uh, very uh, very secure security key uh, so namespace, which uh, need us just to rewrite the variable in the modem SRAM. No key we need to do so. So uh, we think that this namespace, sec namespace, is provided by the modems manufacturer. But those namespace we use to read and write memory was provided by the oh, I'm sorry, security namespace was provided by the vendor and uh, the namespace and its functionality to read and write memory was provided by the vendor and maybe manufacturer don't know about this at all. Because we easily bypass uh, its uh, very security restrictions. And now we already know how to read, how to write memory, and uh, all we need to do is just to execute our, com uh, our code. So let's do it. Yeah, so we had to find the place where we could write the pointer to our payload in order to gain execution. And uh, we have found such place in the process manager, the operating systems process manager. However, there was a limitation. Uh, because uh, the code executed by the process manager was a part of the critical section, so we could not interact with anything virtually. The interrupts were disabled, so we were very limited in what we could do in this context. So we had to find how to improve our situation and get proper code execution. To do that, we have referred to the memory management unit mapping, and we found that we could uh, actually remap the originally read-only code section to become read-write section by just copying the mapping from the data section into the code section. Also, we have found that uh, there were many unmapped physical memory which we could uh, easily map and then uh, use it to store virtually unlimited uh, size payload. So, as a proof of concept, we wanted to gain persistence so that uh, the modem is still compromised even after a reboot. So, to do that, we wanted to utilize the uh, over-the-air provisioning, the mechanism which is documented by the manufacturer. However, it's not activated by default. The activation is local only. It needs you to execute a special AT command. And then after you have activated the OTAP, you can operate it by using special SMS messages. However, we found that the operating system checks whether the OTAP has been activated or not by checking presence of a file on the modem's file system. So if the file exists, the OTAP is enabled. If no file exists, the operating system will ignore this special SMS messages. So we needed to create the file in order to use the mechanism. And uh, at this point, we need to somehow to communicate with our code on the modem side. And the easiest way we found is to just inject our code in the uh, SMS handling process, so we can now send our special SMS messages with special IDs uh, in its uh, payload, and we can decide if it's our SMS message or not. And the last step is to somehow uh, gain the possibility to uh, work with the modem's file system. To do so, we are reverse engineering the modem's operation system, find out how its drivers work, and write our own driver for its file system and install it uh, to uh, operation system through the hyperfall vulnerability. So as its uh, driver gain us the ability to work with the modem's file system remotely via SMS messages, we named it, of course, SMSFS, uh, and it was implemented uh, in uh, assembly using the only needed functions to read, write, uh, open, close, and so on functions. And so we can uh, now create a proof of concept stand that let us unlock the other provision mechanism using hyperfall vulnerability and uh, just using this mechanism, install our own midlet. And, uh, of course, uh, 
using those vulnerabilities we talked about in the midlet topic, we can easily install not only user or midlet, but we can maybe exchange the manufacturer one, and this all can be done remotely. So there is a full-fledged proof of concept for compromising a Centurion modem from the first sub SMS message to uh, persistence via installing our own midlet. In the conclusion, we want to highlight that these modems are using not only in the telephones, but uh, they're using in uh, such areas like uh, automotive, where you need uh, maybe uh, physical access to update its firmware. And uh, so, as a mitigation, we uh, strongly uh, recommend that you will restrict to send the such SMS messages and better all SMS messages to those modems on the mobile telecommunication side. Uh, all our findings we report to the manufacturer. Uh, there are two critical vulnerabilities, one about local privilege escalation vulnerability and another one about remote code execution. Any technical details you can find in our technical paper available on our website. And of course, we'll be pleased to answer questions today in person. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, just a moment. Thank you for your talk. So, just to confirm, if I want to like exploit this modem today, let, let's say it's not patched, right? Using your technique, how long does it take end to end? Like, like you said, five SMS messages, but do they send them all together, or I send one and wait for two weeks and then send another? Like. <laughs> You can send them all together, but first you need to figure out the payload. And it's important that, uh, like, there are time restrictions uh, between you send the SMS messages. The state of the operating system may change. So you need to follow the close timings. It takes a uh, half year for researching and five <laughs> seconds to send. So it's yeah. really fast, like, once yeah. you know everything. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? All right, then. Um, thank you very much for this insightful talk. Please give them a big round of applause.